So as we close in on Easter Sunday, we're doing what Christians have been doing for hundreds of years, and that is to spend these weeks focusing on the suffering and death of Christ. So two weeks ago, if you remember, we looked at the idea that the entire Christian faith can be summed up in the words, Christ crucified. And then last week, Linda showed us how the cross of Christ displays for us God's heart for both mercy and justice. Today, we're going to look at how Jesus himself explains the meaning of his death. And in John chapter 12, we come to Jesus' very last public address in the gospel. Uh, it's Sunday. He's just arrived in Jerusalem for the Passover, which is the story we'll be celebrating next week for Palm Sunday. And this is the last time that Jesus is going to speak to the crowds before he goes dark and eventually will die on Friday. So we'll pick up in John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. So thousands upon thousands of Jews have flooded the streets of Jerusalem for the Passover festival. This was their biggest event of the year. Like, if you didn't go to Jerusalem for Passover, you weren't really Jewish. You were just kind of Jewish. And many of these people were coming to believe that Jesus was, in fact, the promised Messiah they'd been waiting for, the liberating king of the Jews who would rescue them from Roman oppression and restore the kingdom of Israel. So this was a super exciting time for the Jewish people. But here in verse 20, we find out that it's not only the Jewish folks who are excited about Jesus, there are actually some Greeks or non-Jews who've heard about him too. And they find one of Jesus' disciples and say, sir, we want to see Jesus. Now, this would be easy for us to skip over in the narrative, but it's actually a really big deal for Jesus' disciples. Like word is starting to spread. Momentum is building. Their small town rabbi is starting to make waves. It's like when a small local band gets their first big break or when a college athlete is being scouted by the pros. It's like this thing might really happen. Jesus might be the real deal. And the disciples are stoked. So when the Greeks tell Philip that they want to see Jesus, Philip goes and tells Andrew, and then together they both go find Jesus and tell him the good news. There's Gentiles who want to see you. Let's move on in verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So the disciples go and tell Jesus that there's some important people here who want to see him. And instead of saying, bring them back, I want to meet these folks, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, not exactly the answer they were expecting. So what's going on here? When Jesus says that he's going to be glorified, he's saying about these Greeks that want to see him, oh, they're going to see me. The whole world is going to see me. And how's the world going to see him? Well, in the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus talks about the hour, he's talking about his hour, the time of his death. The first three times in John, he says that his hour has not yet come. But now in John 12, he says, the hour has come, or the end is near. So when people start hanging around Jesus, start getting interested in him, want a better look at him, what he says is that if anyone really wants to see him, if they want to know who he really is, then there's no better place to see him than on the cross. So Jesus says that if we really want to understand what he's like, we have to look at his death on the cross. And then he goes on to explain the meaning of his death using a gardening metaphor. Verse 24, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So Jesus starts this teaching by saying, very truly I tell you, or in Greek, literally, he says, 
amen and amen. Amen is often translated as truly or verily. It's Jesus' way of saying, listen up, I'm about to tell you something that you're going to want to hear. So this is one of Jesus' so-called amen statements, and we'd better pay attention. So he says, listen to this. If you want to understand me and my kingdom, think about a seed or like a grain of wheat that in order for it to produce new life, first it has to die. So Jesus in this short parable gives us the meaning of his death, that his life is like this seed. And in just a few days, he's going to die. And just like a seed that gets planted in the dirt, Jesus is going to be buried in the ground. And then, and only then, will new life come forth. So this is not the kind of talk the disciples wanted to hear from Jesus that day. Like thousands of Jews have just thrown him this huge parade, crowning him the king of Israel. And now even Greeks are hearing about this new king and wanting to join the movement. And what they want Jesus to say is that this thing is about to take off, that he's got a vision, that he's got a plan. They want him to rally the troops and storm the capital and make Israel great again. But instead, he tells them that pretty soon he's going to die. And that's exactly what happens. Four days later, he's arrested, and then the next day, he was dead. We like to think of Jesus as a hero. Maybe like a lifeguard who dives into the water and pulls the drowning swimmer to safety. But if you think about it, that's not actually how the story goes. He's actually more like a lifeguard that dives into the water to save a swimmer, and they both drown. We tend to think of Jesus' death on the cross as heroic or victorious, and in some ways it is, but that's not the way they saw it in the ancient world. A few years ago, a bunch of us from Antioch uh, went on a trip to Italy and Germany to trace the story of the Renaissance and the Reformation. And in Rome, right next to the Colosseum, is Palatine Hill, where there's this museum that holds the earliest known depiction of Christ's crucifixion. It's, a call, it's called the Alexa Manos Graffito, and they think it's from around the year 200. So you can see the actual image on the left. It's a piece of ancient Roman graffiti scratched into a plaster wall in a guard room on Palatine Hill that they discovered in 1857. It's hard to make out the image at first, so on the right you see a stone rubbing of the drawing. And what we see is Jesus on the cross, but instead of a human head, he has the head of a donkey. And then we see a man next to him looking up at the cross, and there's a caption at the bottom written in Greek that reads, Alexa Menos worships his God. This is the earliest known depiction of Jesus' death on the cross. And what is it? It's a mockery. It's a sneering jab at both Christ and those early Christians who worshipped him as God. Like depicting Jesus with a donkey's head was about as offensive as you could get at that time. And then to show this early Christian worshiping a man who had been crucified, an execution method reserved for the worst of the worst members of society, they're just making a joke out of this whole thing. One ancient historian even said, the religion of the Christians is foolish inasmuch as they worshiped a crucified man and even the instrument itself of his punishment. They are said to worship the head of an ass, and even the nature of their father. So this is how Jesus' death on the cross was seen in the ancient world. It wasn't glorious. It was ridiculous. It wasn't inspiring. It was embarrassing. It was the kind of thing you wouldn't want to be associated with. And yet, as we've been talking about the cross of Christ for the last couple weeks, it's become an enduring symbol of the gospel, which is just so fascinating. 
A few days ago, my son Moses had his first official BMX race. And we're brand new to the whole BMX scene, and it was probably pretty obvious when he and I showed up to the track for his first race, and all the other kids are decked out in this sweet BMX racing gear, and Mo's wearing jeans and a hoodie. But I was proud of him. He got right in there, and he raced against a bunch of other 11-year-olds, two qualifying races, and then a main event, and he won. He got first place in his very first race, which was pretty cool. And he got a big medal that said first place, and he strolled out of there in his hoodie and his jeans. And of course, I'm a pretty proud dad. It was, it was a good time. Now, would I still be proud of my son if he'd finished last place? Of course I would. I love him no matter what. But it's a little harder to celebrate in the same way when you didn't win. Like, I'm not sure how Mo would have felt going around wearing a medal that said last place. That's not really something you advertise. Maybe you have to do that kind of thing if you lose your fantasy football league or something. But typically, we don't really like to flaunt our failures. But if you think about it, that's what the cross of Christ is. It's a symbol of defeat, of failure, of coming in last. So when Christians floss a cross around our necks, what we're doing is wearing a medal that says, last place. I worship a God who was so hated by the world that they killed him and gave him a jackass for a head. No one in Jesus' day would have looked at his crucifixion as a victory. It was a stinging loss. And so Jesus comes to Jerusalem knowing that it would end in failure. But of course we know that's not the end of the story. Because if you didn't know how gardening works, and you saw someone put a seed in the ground, it might look like the seed is being buried, but it's actually being planted. And when Jesus died and was placed in the tomb, it looked like he was being buried. But the truth is, he was being planted. He's the seed that falls to the ground and dies so that many may live. And if he hadn't died, Jesus would still be the only child of God. But because he did, we all have grown up from him. One man dies and billions and billions are raised to life. See, this is the upside-down nature of the kingdom of Jesus. What looks like failure is actually victory. What looks like death is actually life. What looks like the end is actually the beginning. Which is why when a follower of Jesus dies, of course it's painful. Of course we grieve. But we don't grieve as those without hope. As a pastor, I've had the honor of performing quite a few funerals over the years. And some of those funerals have included a graveside ceremony where the body is lowered into the ground. The last graveside service I officiated was about two years ago on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And it was for Jen's grandpa, John Tatyko, who had immigrated to Canada from the Ukraine during World War II. And as you can see here, he was one of those cool old guys that we want to be. This is him at an axe throwing bar when he was 88. He was that strong but silent kind of grandpa who loved the Lord and loved his wife and was faithful until he passed away at 90 years old. And so when we gathered as an extended family around his grave a couple years ago, I started the service by saying, we all know that behind every good man, there's a good grandson-in-law, which is exactly the kind of joke he would have told. Um, but as we cried and remembered his life together, we laid him in the ground, and each of us took a handful of dirt and poured it over his coffin. Now here's the thing. If you don't understand how the gospel works, then it probably looked like John Tatyka was being buried that day. But he was actually being planted. 
1 Thessalonians 4 says that when Jesus comes again to the earth to make everything new, when he brings the fullness of the kingdom of heaven with him, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise again. See, when you're buried, that's the end. But when you're planted, that's just the beginning. So the good news of God's kingdom isn't that Jesus promises an easy or a comfortable life. It's that he promises resurrection. So whether it's death itself or just all the times when we feel buried by grief or loss or pain or doubt, we know that that's not the end of the story. In Romans 6, Paul says it like this, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This is the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. What looks like failure is actually victory. What looks like death is actually life. And what looks like the end is actually the beginning. Jesus goes on in this final public address to extend this metaphor to the human life and really what it means to follow him. In verse 26, he says, where I am, my servant will be also. So Christ's death on the cross isn't just a historical world-saving event. It's also the model for Christian discipleship. And he touches on two areas of life that will be completely upended if we catch a glimpse of the glory of God on the cross. The first is the way that we come to God in prayer, and the second is the way that we show up in the world. First, the upside-down nature of Christ's kingdom changes the way we come to God in prayer. So even though Jesus knows how his story ends, it doesn't mean that life and death are going to be easy for him. Listen to what he says when he's facing his own death in verse 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So Jesus bears his soul to the crowd. He lets them in on the inner turmoil he's experiencing. He knows that as he approaches the cross, he's about to endure something incredibly painful and humiliating, literally excruciating. And he wants to do it. He knows that this is the reason he came. And at the same time, he doesn't want to do it. His soul is troubled. He's dreading the pain he's about to go through. So what does Jesus do in the face of suffering? What does he do in the midst of these conflicted desires he's experiencing? Jesus turns to the Father in prayer. And what's so interesting is that he actually invites the whole crowd around him into his inner monologue into this battle that's happening within him. And first he tells them what he feels like praying, and then he tells them what he ends up praying. What he feels like praying is, Father, save me from this hour. But what he ends up praying is, Father, glorify your name. So we see that in the face of suffering, there are really two different ways coming to God in prayer. And the first is essentially to ask God to do what we think is best. And the second is to ask God to do what he thinks is best. And Jesus contemplates the first, but he chooses the second. Father, glorify your name. In the Gospels, we have eight different prayers that Jesus prayed. John 12, 28 is the shortest one. 
It's only four words. Father, glorify your name. Jesus is praying, God, display your power and your strength to the watching world. Do something that will blow their minds. Show off your stuff. Show them how big you are, how strong you are, how loving you are, how brilliant you are. This is a hard prayer to pray. And it was even hard for Jesus. It was almost like he had to talk himself into it. The prayer he felt like praying was, Father, save me from this hour. But the prayer he prayed was, Father, glorify your name. And then what happened? Verse 28. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name, and God answers his prayer. This is one of only three times in all of the Gospels that God audibly speaks to Jesus. The first was at his baptism, the second was at his transfiguration, and the third is right here in John 12. God speaks and everyone hears it. And what is God's answer to Jesus' prayer? He says, I have glorified my name and I'm going to do it again. Now there's so much we could say here, but most likely... God is saying to his son, I have already glorified my name in your life. And I'm about to glorify my name again in your death. The name of God is glorified in the life and death of Christ. So God answers Jesus' prayer, just not in the way anyone was expecting. Instead of God's glory looking like power and wonder and majesty, it looks like failure, loss, rejection, and death. Which means that if God uses even death for his glory, then there's nothing he can't use. I love the honesty and the self-awareness that Jesus models for us here. He confesses that there's a prayer he feels like praying, but there's this other prayer that he ends up praying. And the result is that God answers that prayer by using Jesus' death to bring life to the world. So Antioch, I would just say this, when you don't know what else to pray, let this four-word prayer of Jesus be yours. Father, glorify your name. So, first, the upside-down nature of Christ's kingdom changes the way we come to God in prayer. And secondly, the upside-down nature of Christ's kingdom changes the way that we show up in the world. Go to verse 25. Jesus says, Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So Jesus takes this metaphor of the seed being planted in the paradoxical nature of his kingdom, and he says, that's why the lives of his disciples will be marked not by winning, but by serving. He says that once we've seen the glory of the God, the glory of God in his cross, it's going to revolutionize the way that we think about our very lives in this world. And he says the only way really to live is to hate your life, which to some of us who've struggled with depression, we'd say, yeah, that's no problem. But what's he actually talking about here? What does it mean to hate your life? Well, obviously, Jesus isn't saying we should be super grumpy and angry and cynical about our lives. He's using hyperbole to say that if we're going to follow him, we have to leave where we are. We need to leave behind the way of this world, which is self-interest, self-advancement, self-supremacy, and instead follow him in breaking ourselves open and pouring ourselves out for the world cross-shaped love. 
Not long after this, in the second and third centuries, there were these huge plagues that swept through the cities in the Mediterranean world. And everyone was fleeing the cities, going out into the countryside to get away from the masses and to escape the disease. But there was one group that stayed in the cities, the Christians. Why? Because they had the way of the cross burned into their souls. And as the crowds got out of town, they left behind the poor, the weak, the sick, the elderly, those who were most vulnerable to the disease. And the Christians said, rather than fighting for our own rights to comfort and freedom, we're going to lay down our rights to serve the world in love. Rather than self-protection and self-preservation, we're going to deny ourselves, take up our cross, lay down our lives, and follow Jesus. And many of those Christians who stayed in the cities ended up getting the plague and dying alongside the vulnerable. The upside-down kingdom of Jesus changes the way we show up in the world. And if you listen to the teachings of Jesus throughout his ministry, he's always saying this kind of stuff. That the way up is down, the way to power is to serve, the way to true riches is to give your money away. The way to life is self-denial. And so as Christians, we don't primarily ask, what do I need to do to win? But rather we ask, who's winning because of me? To be honest, this may sound honorable, but to the world, it often is going to look foolish or even offensive. We know that one of the hot topics in our country recently has been social media, free speech, censorship, content regulation, all that stuff. And we know that there's lots of people with strong feelings about what should be allowed on the internet and what should be taken down. It's a, it's a big mess. Well, a couple years ago, the Franciscan University of Steubenville, which is a Catholic school in California, posted a series of Facebook ads online promoting their master's program. And the next day, they got a message from Facebook saying that one of their ads had been removed because it contained offensive imagery. Here's the image that Facebook blocked. It's called the San Damiano. And it's a Franciscan crucifix that St. Francis used to pray next to. And as you can see, it's not a particularly gory or graphic image of Christ on the cross. But Facebook flagged it as offensive and took it down. Uh, Here's what their message said. Your image, video thumbnail, or video can't contain shocking, sensational, or excessively violent content. So the news about this whole thing spread pretty quickly and lots of people were upset that Facebook would ban an image of Jesus on the cross, which is, you know, the primary symbol of Christianity. And eventually Facebook did change their mind and said that the ad had been blocked by mistake. But here's what happens next. The Franciscan University posts a follow-up statement saying, that they actually agreed with Facebook's original decision. That the image of Christ on the cross was shocking, sensational, and excessively violent. So here's what their statement said. Indeed, the crucifixion of Christ was all those things. It was the most sensational action in history. Man executed his God. It was shocking, yes, God deigned to take on flesh and was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And it was certainly excessively violent. A man scourged to within an inch of his life, nailed naked to a cross and left to die. All the hate of all the sin in the world poured out its wrath upon his humanity. Isn't that amazing? Instead of being offended, that someone would say the cross is offensive, they affirm that it should be offensive. 
an image of an innocent man being violently tortured and executed should be unsettling. Even Paul in Galatians 5 worried that if the gospel gets too watered down, then the offense of the cross would be removed. So the upside-down kingdom changes the way we show up in the world. So our passage starts with a group of people asking to see Jesus. And it ends with Jesus saying, if they really want to see him, look at the cross. T.F. Torrance was a Scottish minister who would eventually become one of the most significant and respected Christian theologians of the 20th century. But his very first ministry appointment was as a chaplain for the British Army during World War II. And he had an experience as a young chaplain during the war that ended up shaping his entire approach to ministry and theology. And it happened on a battlefield in Italy. And Torrance was going around tending to the wounded soldiers. And he tells the story like this. When daylight filtered through, I came across a young soldier, Private Phillips, scarcely 20 years old, lying mortally wounded on the ground, who clearly had not long to live. As I knelt down and bent over him, he said, Padre, Is God really like Jesus? And I assured him that he was the only God there is. The God who had come to us in Jesus has shown his face to us and poured out his love to us as our Savior. As I prayed and commended him to the Lord Jesus, he passed away. That experience would end up guiding all of Torrance's future work as a minister and a theologian. He became convinced that the dying soldier had put into words the deepest cry of the human heart. Is God really like Jesus? Because if he is, then everything's going to be okay, even if it's not. If God really is like Jesus, then I can trust him with my life. And if God really is like Jesus, then there is hope. There's hope for my life. There's hope for humanity. There's hope for the world. So Antioch, let's fix our eyes on Christ. Look at the cross and see that God really is like Jesus. As we prepare to come to the table this morning, will you join me in this prayer of confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name.